Okay, so I am recording this. Um, I talked to Dr. Cohn about attendance and I told her that I do assign a post for every class and that the students, in order to do the post very well, they'd have to read the material and they'd have to go to the YouTube videos. So I told her, as far as I'm concerned, if they, if they write posts that show they read it and listen to the, the video, um, I do want them to come to class, but I will just call it an excused absence. And I'm not going to try to chase down students to figure out who's excused, who's not excused. And she thought that was fine. There's just too many variables. And I mean, I, I like it when you say, you know, you send me emails and you explain, but you don't have to, right? Basically, I just trust, I trust you. And I don't know why, you know, first of all, it's easier to understand the material if you come to class. And so it's easier to write a post. Um, if for some reason, you don't, you know, you can't make it, it's okay. As long as you cover the material, it doesn't matter. So, um, uh, some of you are much better than others at English. And I don't think that's necessarily your fault. I think that's just the context within which you were educated. Uh, but I, I'll have to lower your grade for that and then just try to motivate you to work on your English because um, by the time you graduate from here, you really need to have good English for a job or for graduate school. And if AUW lets students graduate with bad English, it's going to look bad on the college. The college will lose its reputation. So. I do have to hold your feet to the fire on that because we're all part of a much bigger system. Um, so I, I want you to be aware that I'm on your side, but I do represent the college and also my profession. So there's certain things that I really need to do and I don't mean to punish you, um, but all of life is like that. You might get a job where your employer loves you, but you don't have the skills for the job, so they have to let you go. So it's just kind of life is complicated like that. Um, all right. So those of you who have posted, um, I do think you're getting through the material all right. And also, uh, many of you have said that you did like the discussion groups. And you talked about what you learned, like there were students in the groups from lots of different religious traditions, and you learned things you didn't have any idea about, how they were, how they were raised. So I do think that that's an important part of the class. So if your group isn't working, I think you can come back into the main room and tell me that. And then I will just put everyone in a group that's not working into a bigger group. Um, let's see, I think I will also start trying to make sure which students are sort of on board and make sure that a number of them get into, there's at least a couple of the students who've been sort of keeping up are in each group. And so at this point, I think, I think um, I'm hoping, you know, people aren't gonna just say I'm totally lost. <laughs> um, all right, I will stay after class as usual for questions. And um, I think we can start. So last time I always told my students 
that my job is every day of class to completely blow your mind, right? To give you ideas you've never had and completely mess with your mind. <laughs> so I think last time trying to prove the existence of God probably blew a lot of people's minds. Um, I don't know what that expression is, Sabe Kun. <laughs> What is, you know, I don't even know about emojis. I know about them, but I don't know like the secret code. But anyway, um, so I think trying to prove God is um, probably blows your mind. It's a different kind of reasoning. It's not science, right? He, he isn't trying to prove God by looking at data and, you know, the way a scientist does and predicting more data right? Rather, he's looking at data and drawing a conclusion with his reason, right? So your mind has to get you to infer that given that the material universe doesn't create itself, doesn't order itself, doesn't sustain itself, doesn't, um, there must be another force Right, an uncreated creator, an un, uh, an uncomplicated, you know, simple. God has to be simple. God has to be the ultimate force behind everything. And then, how do we draw that conclusion? Well, the things that that are the farthest from us, and the things that. Um, there are the forces in the universe, E equals MC squared, all that. Those forces are simple and, and the universe functions in a way that everything has uh, realizes the potential to be complex, but within limitations that make it all ultimately understandable. It doesn't mean you understand everything, but it means the aspect of reality that we can understand is also the aspect that has the most force, like the echosphere. We can understand the echosphere as a whole better than we can understand any particular part. We don't know, you know, when the tree releases a zillion seeds, we don't know which seed is going to turn into another tree but we know that that's the pattern. That's the way nature works. And ultimately it's because of that pattern that that species will survive. So it's just, um, it's really kind of common sense. And I didn't mean, as some of the students really wanted to pursue that, which is great. But my main point there is that this kind of reasoning is natural that this is a way to reason that unites Muslims with Christians and Jews, which normally they're at war against each other for lots of other reasons. But if there's an ultimate force, then we shouldn't, you know, ultimately be at war with each other, okay? It's not really the way the universe works. Um, all right, so that was that. But what I want to focus on today is not two things. I mean, I when I talked about Augustine, I talked about the power of guilt, right? Because Augustine is always saying the temporal is naughty and bad. Okay. But when St. Thomas Aquinas unified Aristotle with Catholicism, the main goal there and this is for any religion that's why I did that God thing right that this isn't just about Christianity and it isn't even just about religion it's just saying the different religious doctrines are not important the similarities are important and do you think and what I want to present to you is two ideas that might blow you away but but I really want to get them across. That whatever your view of God is, God wants you to flourish. God doesn't want you to feel guilty for being born. 
God wants people to be fully human, to use their minds, to help each other, to use their reason to take care of each other, to develop yeah. technology, as long as they don't use that technology to destroy the creation, right? So when we're using it to undermine the ecosystem and we know we're doing that, pride, that's greed, that's psychologically sick. But a healthy psyche should always know that the universe is there. We're supposed to be intellectually curious. We're supposed to develop those virtues. Um, there's nothing to feel guilty about other than that you're not working hard enough to develop your capacities, right? And um, also that the sexism, the racism, the class, uh, discrimination, all of that, none of that is natural. None of that is what any legitimate idea of God would want, right? Those are social constructions. The ways that the word God has been used, God is omniscient, omnipotent, all that, and God says women are inferior, okay? No. <laughs> so in humanist religion, so these are the branches of every religion that are also spiritual humanists. So you have Christian humanism. So Aurora, you should turn up your mic. Um, so there's Christian humanism, there's Muslim humanism, there's Hindu humanism, there's uh, Buddhism humanism and all of those and there's secular humanism there's spiritual humanism aurora okay. yes professor yes you want to turn off your mic yeah yeah sorry okay. that's that it's okay anyway so that's what i want to present to you that idea and blow your mind right were you raised that way or not um and then the second point I want to make to blow you away is that religion should always be progressive and radical and um, holding every form of power accountable. Every religious leader and believer should always be questioning people in power. Religion should never be nationalistic. It should never be blind obedience to an orthodoxy, to a set of beliefs. It should always question whether people are hiding behind those beliefs and engaging in vicious activity, right? Uh, Jesus did this, Buddha, Confucius. They're always looking at the person behind the words or looking at the leader behind the words. So all of those prophets are expecting that leaders rule for the benefit of the ruled. And all of them ended up questioning and getting in trouble for it. So the idea here is that every legitimate religious tradition is anti-blind faith, anti-patriotism, anti-racist, -race, anti-sexist, right? It's progressive. Um, and that's those are the ideas I want to present you with today. And that those ideas are alive and well in the world. And Pope Francis, uh, when he spoke to the UN, uh, presented a lot of those ideas. So I'm going to go over his outline and I'll go over Martin Luther King. But I do want you to take notes, take note of what you want to bring up in your groups. So it's probably true that you already came to class with some notes, but just make a longer list and I will give you as much time as you need 
And um, I know that, I think it was last time the students said we need more time. And yet there was one group that was sort of faltering, but now that I've read what you were doing, of course, you know, I would like to give you as much time as you think is productive because you know, you know, if you, you know, what you're doing and whether it's valuable. Um, all right, so let me just start here with the stream. I copied the stream just so, so we're all literally on the same page and everybody knows what's going on. At the last class, I said, we'll start out with Augustine. Um, his view of reason is math. We have the, his, and math has the eternal truth. It has nothing to do with the temporal world. And so that was Augustine. Um, so Aquinas, um, my goal there was to get you to, to understand that this is a natural way to reason. Um, and it was thrown out in the modern world, not necessarily for the right reasons. It was thrown out because the Catholic Church was thrown out, right? The scientists and the church were at odds with each other. Okay, go ahead. Um, let's see, somebody raised their hand. Go ahead. Professor? Yep. Sorry for the problem. Um... I'm here. Uh, I could not give the attendance. I joined late. Right, that's okay. What I, I explained attendance on this, um, and I and I will um, I will write names down while you're in the breakout groups also. So, if your other teachers take attendance at the beginning of class, I'm not going to do that. So I'm just going to move on, and and you can check out the video what I said about that. So, okay, let's see. All right, so the attachment on Pope Francis. Okay, so when I covered Aristotle, I said that that kind of humanism is compatible with other religious traditions and with many kinds of humanism, right? So now this lecture or this, what we started last time, shows you exactly in one case how Pope Francis unites reason and faith on current controversial issues, right? So we had uniting reason and faith in proving the existence of God. That's one thing. Now we have it on how you should live your life very specifically, right? You should not only have the personal virtues, but also political. So part of being a full human being for Aristotle is getting involved in political life, criticizing the uses, the abuses of power. That's, those are all the political virtues. And so Francis knows that. He knows he's read his Aristotle and he very deliberately has made a list of points that he knows unite reason and faith he knows that he gave the speech at the United Nations. So when I had the United Nations Declaration of Rights and Capabilities that very first day, that I've been you know, trying to explain that these do go together. So Pope Francis is standing there at the UN and people from all different countries, all different ethnicities, religions, whatever, they're all listening and what Pope Francis very carefully picked things that he thought would resonate with everyone. That's why the UN is possible. We have a common humanity. We have these capabilities and this is how we can use them. We can abuse them and he's giving his list. So I really like his list and it's a call to action, right? Uh, to speak up when it comes to controversial issues. Um, then, what do you think about this? Each of you probably have a different opinion. Do you think all the religious traditions should agree to this? Do you think secular humanists should come together with 
people from different religions. In other words, there's no need to separate science from religion on this, on uh, Pope Francis' view. It doesn't conflict with science in any way. Um, all right, he's also, yeah, the, the he's very active right now in working towards sustainability. He is really worried about climate change. Um, but mostly, uh, I have a whole nother class on that. So this one is about psychology. Like, what is a healthy psyche? So again, you, you need to think, is it a healthy psyche to exercise all these capabilities, even if it makes your life complex, right? So what Seneca was saying was that um, suffering, he's going through all the different kinds of suffering. If you decide that the best thing for you to do at this time in your life is to have a public life, yes, you will suffer. People will blame you for stuff that isn't your fault, but that's okay, you know, because you're developing your capabilities. Uh, you shouldn't be afraid of suffering. So, what is a healthy psyche, right? Is a healthy psyche one that tries to avoid suffering? No, therapists will tell you, if you try to run away from it, it just gets worse. So in this class, uh, everything I say today is going to be also filtered through your idea of what is a healthy psyche, right? So religious bigotry, for example, thinking you're better because your belief system is unhealthy psychologically. It's unhealthy emotionally. It corrupts your character, right? As, as well as your behavior. So it's, it's that kind of a take on it. And then I will discuss Martin Luther King. And um, I don't know how much each of you has been aware of Black Lives Matter or all over the world, there were all those demonstrations related to racism in the whole global economic system. And um, so each of you, again, in your small groups, you can talk about if you got involved or if you actually at least followed it. And then if you didn't, if you've been you know, focused on other things. I would hope that you would want to get engaged. Um, all right, and you don't have to read the whole letter, so I won't go through the whole thing. All right, so that's that's what we're going to do here. And um, all right, I'll go to the next one, to the, let's see, here we go. All right. So let's go to Francis's outlines. Ah, all right. So here on this outline, we're going to once again make that transition from Augustine to Aquinas. All right. So Augustine was the one that focused on eternal law. Um, St. Thomas focuses on natural law the ability to understand according to eternal law. Um, okay, the natural law is theoretically the same in everyone, but some, but it's actually, you know, it gets activated differently and people have different cap cap capacities, right? I'm not good at math, other people are. Some people are better at science and um, going to college this is the traditional curriculum for colleges in the US, liberal arts colleges. And again, maybe it is in your, in your uh, countries. You can you know write that down in your posts or not. But it is at AUW. AUW started with some idea of liberal education. Um, and then so what I had to offer, what they wanted, um, Dr. Cohn was happy that I'd been trained in this just because she felt like somebody should bring this in, this perspective in with all the other things that go on at the school. So um, in theory, 
those capabilities are natural, but in fact, everyone develops them according to their interests, their opportunities. Um, but we often disagree on details, right? We can still agree that we have fundamentally things in common as human beings, and then we can disagree on the details. Um, okay, let's see. So certain natural laws can't be changed, right? Innocent people can never be killed. Um, but, you know, people apply it differently. So until relatively recently, when I first started teaching, the Catholic Church still accepted capital punishment, which is just like, what? Uh, the state is killing people? Um, but they changed because, of course, the people they kill are not innocent. But the church finally decided that as long as somebody can convert, the state should not kill them, right? Um, it's not the business of the state to prevent someone from the possibility of changing. Um, all right. All right. Sin and ignorance corrupts our habits. So you can think about when people disagree, is it because they just don't know certain things or is it because they're greedy or because they're self-interested? You know, what is the cause of the disagreement? Um, Okay, and then divine law is higher than human law. And I talked about that last time, I think. So there's two goals in life, right? Eternal salvation and wisdom. Um, and they shouldn't contradict. The, the kind of activism, the kind of participation in public life that's part of wisdom is also what God would want and what you know, you'll be judged on the basis of. Um, okay, human laws should follow from divine law, but human law can only use temporal punishments. Uh, a judge cannot, uh, you know, zap you so that you repent from your sin. All the judge can do is throw you into jail, right? And think about it, you know, maybe you want to repent, but I can't do anything about that. Um, let's see. Ah, human laws should not be changed often because people will not respect the law. And justice is a character trait. This is also Aristotelian. That a person is just when every day in every way they always try to rule for the sake of the ruled. They always try to do what's appropriate. Um, it's a character trait. And then people like that are much better at making laws or at evaluating laws and recognizing that some laws are unjust or the way that a judge or a jury applies the law is unjust. There's so many layers and layers of justice and of virtue that it takes a person with a general character trait to be able to evaluate, assess all these different judgments. Um, all right. So when societies, this is what's, this is why I'm telling you that I think religious people are radical, right? When societies are unjust, um, religious people should call them out, right? Um, they shouldn't constantly be trying to change everything. They shouldn't, in general, they should try to work within the system to change it because people, tend, tend, people need order. And when you blow up the whole system, there's chaos and the likelihood that you would get a strong man leader who would be even worse. So I think religious people like Martin Luther King and like Pope Francis, they, they want to work within the system, but they call out the leaders for their corruption or for their lack of judgment or their ignorance. But if it gets bad enough, um, if a society is so driven by greed 
sometimes it's lawful. Well, sometimes it's lawful to declare war uh, because a country has come after you. There, you're as long as it's in self-defense. You've tried other means. So there's what's called the just war theory, and and Islam has a just war theory that's very similar. Um, it's okay to kill in self-defense, but it's even okay to go against your own government if it's hopelessly corrupt. It's not going to change. You can have these movements, right? That um, they aren't violent movements, but they're huge social movements that try to replace the government, the entire government with a new government. Um, all right, so you can do that in the name of eternal law. So the idea there is that religious law is higher than any sort of nationalism or temporal law, but you have to have really good people, people who have a just character and a virtuous character who have can make the kind of judgment about when should we work within the system and when is the system absolutely too corrupt, unwilling to change, and how can we avoid violence? How can we try to overthrow the government without creating uh, complete chaos? All right, so these are the values of the, with the, the nuns that I live with um, every summer. And again, you can compare those to your own values, whatever you learned. I think um, they fit. All right, so what I'll go through is the list. And, and this is what I'd like you to discuss in your groups. And I'll leave it on like this. And I'll also give you access to be able to, um, to post that, share your screen. So I'll put multiple screen sharing or whatever you're supposed to do. Um, all right, so just for a minute, I'm gonna slow down so that all of you are processing this and thinking, what am I gonna say in my group, right? So every kind of fundamentalism, that would be a conservatism, religious or not, is bad because somehow I'm better because of what I believe. Um, and reject your delusion that you're smarter or more virtuous or whatever than you really are. And your extremism, like if somebody says all religion is bad, that's, that's false. <laughs> or all secular humanists are bad. He just reject all of that stuff. Okay, I'm gonna stop for a minute. Does anybody have a question about what I'm asking you to do? I just want you to associate that with your own life, with what you've been taught or the people around you and then think, well, do I agree with the Pope or not? That's mainly, any, any questions or comments? Does this make sense in terms of Aristotle? He just said virtues are what count, right? Not your beliefs. And you always find the mean between extremes. You're always real, willing to reason with other people. Okay. Reject partisan bickering. In other words, somebody's not evil because of the political party they belong to. It's the behavior. So political parties should work together, just like individuals should work together um, for the common good, not just to help each other out. Um, also, the political goal, having your country flourish, should be not at the expense of another country. It should be international. Any, that should be, every religious believer should accept that 
Every secular humanist should accept that. Any questions or, excuse me, comments on that one? You can think about whether in your country, the politicians just demonize each other because of what party they're in, or if they work together. You can think about, do your politicians uh, like Trump say, you know, America first, right? That's nationalism. Are they more interested in that than in working together with other countries? Okay, stop punishing immigrants. All right. And this, um, this, this is very biblical. So the whole Old Testament, which would be Muslims as well as Christians and Jews uh, are about the Jewish people were wandering in the wilderness, right? And they needed help. The uh, hospitality is a great virtue in the Old Testament because many contexts where people really needed hospitality from other people. Um, all right, the next one. Yeah, immigrants is a big problem. Obviously it's a big problem in Bangladesh, my gosh, with the ones coming in from Myanmar. So, and that's that, I mean, as an American, this is an incredibly difficult situation, right? Because it, I think it's the most immigrant, the most refugees in the world and two of the poorest countries in the world. It's not like Bangladesh has extra resources. And the US, you know, is closing its borders and the US has all these resources. So as an American, it's just flat out embarrassing. Um, so, but I think um, the international community, the UN and all these NGOs are trying to come in because they understand that, right? That the quantity of, of refugees and then the relative wealth of the countries involved makes this a major, major problem. Um, foreign policy, it can't be, you know, might makes right. I'm stronger than you, therefore I get to make the rules in my favor. So the golden rule, treat other people as you would want to be treated. Okay, every major religion has the golden rule. Every secular humanist should follow the golden rule. Powerful nations need to set the example. And I, and I, I agree, Dr. Beck, that's you. And your stupid country is like, yes, I know. Uh, but, Biden is much better than Trump. I hope you know that. Um, and I, let's see, okay. Greed causes injustice. So I, again, filtering all this through a healthy psyche. Does a healthy psyche follow the golden rule? Does that, you know, you have to train your emotions, right? Is somebody who's emotionally inclined to follow the golden rule. It doesn't mean they won't suffer, they will. Um, but if you have to have the confidence in yourself, believe in yourself that I'm suffering because I'm good and I'm making this person look bad, <laughs> right? And so, the stories of Jesus and Muhammad and all that are telling you that even if you suffer for standing up, it's the right thing to do. And so it's the psychologically healthy thing to do. So you have to have your own standard of psychological health. You can't let the world determine this, right? You have to make up your mind. I think it's healthier to stand up to power than to deny it or um, enter, you know, just uh, dissipate your energies, distract yourself, um, escape, you know. So it's, it's really up to you. Greed, is greed a, a disease of your psyche, right? It certainly has terrible effect on other people. Um, okay, the goal is, okay, ah, 
rehabilitation. So when you're punishing people, you try to rehabilitate them. Um, abortion is, is wrong, but, it, but the problem is if you make it illegal, you have more abortions. And so the Pope isn't saying, you know, everybody should make it illegal, but he's saying, don't do it. Um, I know in the US, we have a lot fewer abortions if we make it legal and have sex education and contraception available. Um, create good jobs. So a strong middle class, people are psychologically healthier if they're middle class, if they're not desperate, or if they don't have delusions about themselves because they have money, they think they're more virtuous than they are. Those are psychological uh, diseases. So creating, in, creating jobs, strengthening the middle class is another psychologically healthy thing to do. Um, stop ignoring climate change, that's another Willed ignorance about that is not healthy. It should be in your mind. Um, and the Pope is in favor of science and technology. He wants them to be used in the service of worshiping God, respecting the creation. Um, let's see. My job is to build bridges. Okay. Worry about the legacy you leave behind for the next generation. All right. Now, I'm going to put you into breakout rooms, but I'm also going to, let's see, screen share. How do I, okay. I think after I put it in there, then I'll punch some button that'll say you can, you can share your screen so you could bring that outline up if you want to. Um, I'm gonna put you in groups of about four so that um, four or five so that everyone gets a chance to talk. But if your group falters, I can put you into another one of the groups. So here you go. Um, all right. Okay. There's Martino. I'll just put her in there. All right. Okay, so what I want to talk about are wedge issues. And these are issues that politicians use to manipulate the public, to get votes, to present this appearance of virtue and trustworthiness. And they have to put it on really thick because in the meantime, they're just helping their friends and harming their enemies. And they're just using the society to give money and power to their family and friends. So every religious leader should be right on top of them and every secular humanist, right? Should hold them accountable. And they should say politicians should never claim to be religious because if they are religious, it's what they do. It's not what they say, right? So a good politician would would say, here, look, this is what I'm doing. This is how I'm trying to tax the rich and provide efficient, well-structured public schools and um, organizations and programs and institutions that actually have evidence-based shown to help per, uh, cultivate the middle class, right? It's not sexy, it's not anything, it's just uh, constantly making judgments. This program is evidence-based. This program is not. Um, so politicians, you know, you should never let them talk about how religious they are. The gay, the gay issue in my country was used as a wedge issue 
the people in charge. Mr. Cheney had a gay daughter he really liked, but being gay, demonizing gay people was a way to win an election in 2004. It was just a tool. It was not, but a lot of gay people suffered. So just don't pay attention to that. It's how you treat people. You've got to look under the surface. A politician cannot make anybody gay or prevent anyone from being gay. What politicians can do is promote a middle class, tax the rich, help the poor or not. Um, okay, so that's all right, Nujat, if that's the way it is. Um, she's, the weather in Chittagong is making it hard. But anyway, don't let politicians be self-righteous. Don't let them say, you know, well, we're better than so-and-so, no. How are you using your power? Are you ruling for the sake of the world or not? That's all I wanna hear from you. Another big wedge issue is in my country, it's guns, right? And apparently there's a, uh, California has made the machine guns, right? AK-47, machine guns. It's illegal to buy a machine gun. Well, a judge said that that violates our constitution, that it, it's legal, it should be legal for every American to have a machine gun. I was like, what? And so that is not ruling for the sake of the rule, right? That is undermines well-being, it undermines the middle class, it leads to 30 plus thousand murders a year. But again, a politician could get up on a soapbox and say stuff and it's a misinterpretation of our constitution and all this stuff. Okay, another big wedge issue is abortion because the, the politicians, um, they, the ones that, that were really anti-abortion, one of them turned out to be having an affair and to have told his girlfriend to get an abortion. Um, another one, one of the big ones had had a four and a half year affair with a married woman. Who knows if he ever told her to get an abortion, maybe she wouldn't tell him. I mean, it's, it's complete hypocrisy. Like you should not vote for someone based on their position on abortion because that's manipulation. They can't do anything about it. They don't get pregnant themselves. It's just, it's definitely used as a tool, but it's not. That's why the Pope, he includes that, right? He definitely includes it, but he doesn't put it in with, you've got to stop the international arms race. You've got to be politically, you know, all this other stuff, climate change, that's way more important. And it's something politicians can do. And it's something only political leaders can do. Abortion is important, but it's not anything political leaders can affect. In the US, the people who want it illegal, just it leads to more abortions. So it's annoying to me the way they use that. I personally think if there is a hell, there's a special place in hell for politicians that use the unborn to, to try and gain votes and money and power because that's, <laughs> that is really bad. Um, so anyway, those are wedge issues and every religious leader should be calling politicians out on that. But anyway, Pope Francis is calling political leaders out. He's at the UN, he's telling these people, this is what you have to do. And, and every religion should agree with this and every humanism should agree with this. So. Um, you can put that in your posts. Now I'm going to do the Martin Luther King one. Um, so I don't know, again, how many of you were involved in any sort of the Black Lives Matter or racist, racism demonstrations last summer. There certainly were a, a lot of them. Um, and uh, maybe if even if you weren't then, you know, maybe you will want to do this in the future. 
So you have to ask yourself, right? What's a psychologically healthy life? What's a flourishing life? Do I want this to be part of my life? I think when it comes to sexism, right? Um, I think all of you feel like you must think it's wrong or you wouldn't you know, be going to college. There's a lot of sexism that says women should never go to college. So, but how is it that it's even possible for you to do that is because of the activism of women and feminists before you. So you are benefiting from all that act activism. So it's a legacy that was left for you. So what do you want to pass on, right? What legacy? What do you want your daughters to say, you know? Do you want to try and create a better world for your daughters and their daughters and whatever? Okay, so you, you need to think about that. Um, so this one is particularly about race and we will get into sexism in a, in a week or two. That, that comes up, there are specific lectures related to that. I guess I have um, June 18th down for that one. Uh, but, okay, so the old, the Bible um, is, the Bible has been used to justify slavery. So an honest, right, an honest religious person would say that the Quran, the Bible, the Bhagavad Gita, all these holy books, they have been used to justify injustice. And so you have to, you know, decide which is the correct interpretation, which one is more faithful to the spirit of the religion. Um, all right, the prophets were, they criticized social injustices, Moses, Amos, um, Jesus, Paul, Martin Luther King. He considers himself a prophet. Um, he compared himself to Moses. Um, he's, um, anyway, so he understands that whole tradition. And I think all of you should understand it. Um, Nonviolence, civil disobedience is important. Uh, religious, um, civil questioning of the authorities should be nonviolent. Um, let's see. Aristotle was used to justify slavery, but that is a complete misinterpretation of what he said. <laughs> Uh, I don't want to get into it, but um, it gets abused, right? And then Augustine talks about human law, right? I just went through that earlier. The treatment of African Americans by whites or any kind of racism, um, that's a, a violation of our innate ideas of good and evil. Because if these ideas are innate, every human being has them because they're universal to the human species, right? If we all have these ideas, according to Augustine, then treating what men different from women is wrong, violates eternal law. Treating anyone differently on the basis of race is a violation of eternal law. Um, okay, St. Thomas, our, so he, he would, you know, he adds natural law, he adds Aristotle, segregationist laws, racist laws were unnatural because they justified people treating each other differently um, based on something other than their humanity. It also violates, violates natural law and it violates divine law. So religion and science and politics and religion should be, should be functioning on the same principles. Um, all right. Ah, the moderates. So here's another issue that you'll have to come up with confront in your lifetime. There's 
been racism, there's been exploitation of the natural world. A lot of things have been going on. And what is it about you stepping into um, college in the year 2020, 2021? What is it that absolutely needs to change in your time that it can't be put off anymore? So what happened with Martin Luther King, people said, well, just wait, you're going too fast. And it's just like people resist change and you have to just say, no, we've already avoided changing this way too long. Like now is the time. And I think definitely environmental things um, are going to come into the fray uh, about with it's now is the time, right? But, but from a psycho psychological point of view, what sort of frame of reference do you want to have in your mind? What do you think is a healthy, appropriate worldview? according to which to mold your emotions, to mold your character, to mold your way of life. Um, now, you could have uh, a law that's just unjust. The law itself is unjust. Um, any kind of inflicting, any kind of racism is an unjust law. Sometimes the law seems to be just, but the way it's applied. So Martin Luther King was, uh, his movements were, people were arrested because they were parading without a permit. <laughs> now that's good to have to get a permit. It's just that he applied for a permit and he was refused a permit, right? For no good reason. And so he broke the law. Well, that's a bad application of the law. Um, all right, and there's a difference between breaking the law when a, a racist person kills uh, an African-American in cold blood, right? For no reason. That's very different defying the law than parading without a permit, right? <laughs> These are, you know, you can't just say he's a lawbreaker. Um, all right. People's consciences can go against the legal system. And that's happened throughout the Old Testament. Um, everything Hitler did in Germany was legal. Everything that the people who fought against Hitler did was illegal. So the laws are not, you know, the human laws can be unjust. All right. Um, so this letter explains the principles behind what he's, what he's doing. And so I do want you to think about, do you know of any movements recently? Do you know of any in your country's history? Do you know of any last summer? Do you know of the 360 degree project about environment? Do you know about Greta Thunberg? Do you know about any of these other uh, movements? Do they function on these same principles? And I would think they probably do. Um, he's explaining why he's come to Birmingham, um, why he's tried. They tried to um, get change, right? So. All other avenues had been tried. So he explains in the letter all the other things they tried to do, and it didn't work. Um, innocent people, his movement is legitimate because they're not going to kill innocent people, right? It just, now somebody, a segregationist, might kill an innocent bystander or an innocent demonstrator, but that's not their fault, right? They're not going to kill any innocent people. It will work toward establishing the natural law. It, it's a critique of human law based on natural law. It works toward ending might makes right. The only reason white people have power is because the only reason 
is because they have power, right? It's completely a matter of might and it's not right. If it works toward making people who rule, rule for the sake of the ruled, it does, right? This kind of demonstrating does fit all these criteria for virtue. The time is right. Um, these are, do you remember when Aristotle had his deliberation? He talked about practical wisdom. What are the options? Your, your goal is flourishing. You have to set, if you're good at it, you can set up, here's all the possible options. Here's the best option and here's why. This is exactly what Martin Luther King is doing. He's saying we had an option of, you know, trying to change the laws and they wouldn't do it. We had, so that wasn't an option anymore. We have an option of violent resistance, but we're not gonna do that. We're gonna choose nonviolent civil disobedience because it's the best option. And we're gonna choose action rather than inaction because now is the time not to act is to perpetuate injustice, right? Because we wanna prevent the next generation from being experiencing injustice. What about the argument that it, you're, you're causing the violence? He's not causing it. It's the white supremacists that are causing it. It's the mean between extremes, right? One extreme is accepting oppression. The other extreme is violent resistance. So at that time, the, the black movements that were more violent were getting more and more uh, members. So Martin Luther King was really in the middle, but it was becoming more and more, the potential for violence was increasing and then he got shot and then things did get more violent. Um, okay, so his goal is that he's saying uniting reason and faith will lead to the what we are doing. Reasonable people should join us reasonable humanists, secular humanists, and reasonable religious people. Um, in, the, in the Black Lives Matter, in the George Floyd killing, again, I don't know how much you know about this, but in the memorial service to George Floyd, the, the preacher was, you know, I think a Baptist whatever, African-Americans in the US are in general very religious. The church has been their way of reminding themselves that they are equal. So the church, African-American church has always been outside of the mainstream, questioning the racist status quo for the sake of something higher. So it's, it's been a good religious tradition. Um, but there were obviously people also demonstrating that were secular humanists. And so when the preacher said everybody should uh, bow their heads and pray, <laughs> he said, or meditate or do whatever it is that you're comfortable with, right? <laughs> because this is the world we live in, is a world where they tend to be separated. But it, they shouldn't be. It's not, it's really a misunderstanding of the actual, you know, virtues, the way of life behind it. What are the steps? Okay, so I want you to think about if you would ever consider starting a nonviolent campaign or participating in a nonviolent campaign. So I want you to discuss this in your groups. You could say, I've never thought about it before, but it makes sense. Or, you know, I mean, you have to think, I'm forcing you to address the question. I was in a demonstration earlier this morning. Um, it's about gun violence, but it wasn't a very big one. It's just that when I got the announcement, okay, if I can get there, I'm gonna get there because because it's the only way to keep a democracy honest is when there are big demonstrations. And I, you do need to think about this too. 
if somebody has organized a demonstration, it's important if you agree, you need to get there unless you can't. Because if you don't get there, the people in power think either you agree with them or you don't care. And you don't want, to, you know, if you really do agree with the demonstrators, you must get to the demonstration, okay? Um, all right, so if you're going to do a nonviolent campaign, there's a lot of things you need to prepare. The facts, what are the facts? And you present those facts to the court system, right? Then there's negotiation. You try to negotiate, right? Then you, he had these workshops, practice. You know, if they, if they turn the fire hose on you, don't fight back, right? If they turn the dogs on you, don't fight back. So you have to practice because it's not natural not to fight back. The other thing they used was economics. They boycotted white stores around Easter time. And so that's another way, uh, economic sanctions. And then when none of that worked, they had direct action, right? Um, the goal is to get people to sit down and negotiate. Then they get accused of breaking laws. Would this happen in your country? In your country, does your, do your political leaders embrace nonviolent civil questioning of the authorities or do they silence it? Do they throw people in jail? Like, what is your country like? Um, do they accuse demonstrators of breaking laws, right? He says it's our moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. In other words, if you don't disobey them, you're defective, right? It's immoral not to disobey. Um, and a just law is one that fits with universal laws. An unjust law is one might makes right. Um, you shouldn't be obsessed about order. You should care more about justice. Um, ah, he's called extreme, right? He said, I've been called an extremist. Okay, and then we go back to Aristotle. What is the mean and what are the extremes? Um, and he said, well, Jesus was an extreme extremist. Paul, all these people who question the authority. Uh, the church as a social institution. Okay, I want you to think about this. Because what I've read about in your posts is that it sounds like most of you, the church is super conservative. Um, and it's a social club. <laughs> but what should it be really? Um, so he gets accused of people say, no, the religion shouldn't have anything to do with this world or with social action. And he says, no, that's not true. Every, every major leader created tension, brought it, brought the problems into the public sphere, forced people, confronted people. Um, okay, so here is the letter. Now, I've given you a lot of things to, to discuss in your groups. I, I don't think I need to, you know, scroll through the letter anymore. Does anybody have questions? Because last time a group said, I don't know what we're supposed to do. And I was like, okay. What you're supposed to do is think about, is there some injustice, sexism, racism, environmental destruction, abuses by politicians? Is there some injustice that you're convinced, right, it exists in your country? Have you ever considered getting involved 
in a nonviolent resistance movement? Do you think in your lifetime there will be these kind of movements? What do you think you should get involved? If so, do you think Martin Luther King's four-step process is the philosophical beliefs underneath them? Do you think there are universal truths that governments are accountable to follow? Do you think citizens should hold their governments accountable? All right, those are the questions that I would like you to address in your groups. Now, does anybody have a question before I put you back into your groups? Professor, can we get a short break before? Oh yeah, of course. All right, that's fine. Does anybody else have a question? But that's great, Mewa. I get so wrapped up in this stuff, you know, that I forget. But does anybody have a question because what I'll do then is I'll put you in groups, go for your break, and um, then you can start. But let, let me make sure nobody is confused and nobody's going to not say anything. All right. Okay. Um, so go ahead. Uh, go ahead, have a break, and I will get you in some groups, okay? okay. Professor, how long is the break? Oh, five, take five. What is it usually in your other classes? Some professors, 30 minutes, some 15, like that. Really? Some 20. Yeah. Oh my gosh. My other classes are like 40 to 50 minutes. Like that. <laughs> oh, so since it is a three hour class, uh, so we get our long break after the first half, and then we'll continue the second half. That's what we were having in the summer course. Well, okay, I'll, I'll give you, let's see. Uh, I'll give you seven minutes, guys, sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay, thanks. thanks. Thanks, I guess I wanted to know that. I didn't really want to know that, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, take a break. Okay, so let me resume. All right, so I just want you to get to get these arguments in your head to make them part of your psychological orientation toward life. Um, don't run away from suffering. Don't, you know, sort of set yourself up to suffer. That can happen. You know, people can say, can be sort of martyred. They can martyr themselves unnecessarily, but just be prepared, right? Life is like this. So if there's a big social movement in your country, figure out what's going on and what do I want to do? Because not to decide is to decide. You're deciding complacency. You're deciding that the powers that be are okay because that's the message you're, you're sending as long as you don't participate. So, um, all right. So I think, yeah, go ahead into your groups. Okay, Christina. Go to group five.
Oh. Yeah, Aisha? Are you there? Hello. Hello, Professor. Yeah. Oh, actually, I was disconnected. I mean, today I have really bad internet. So could you please again hello? To sure. Me? Which group were you in, do you know? No, I couldn't see. I was That's all right. I'll just put you, yeah, there's one with only three. I think it's the weather. Yeah. I say I again got disconnected. Can you okay. Back? Yep. Which do you know who was in your group? Group four. Okay. Okay, so as I said, I think that AUW is based on uh, humanism, and uh, there are a number of, number of people who would not want it to be Aristotelian humanism because 
Aristotle was used as a big bludgeon for colonialism, uh, but I don't think it needs to be interpreted that way. Right? It's that was the bias of the people who were using it, and they did use it as a tool, uh, but I don't think it has to be. So, uh, but you do you do need to know that it has been in the past and it could still be abused, but there has to be some sort of basic foundation. Now, the next thing, I'm gonna talk for the next hour about utilitarianism. This is the radical, radical shift from an ancient worldview to a modern worldview. And um, if you look at science, the way science is now, you know, conducted. In the modern world, scientific method, you know, is about facts, gathering facts, formulating a hypothesis, formulating an experiment to prove or disprove the hypothesis, and then, you know, either confirming or not confirming your hypothesis. It could be science, it could be social science. But when that method was introduced or reintroduced in the modern period, uh, Aristotle considered himself an empiricist. So, um, but when it was reintroduced, it was set up as anti religion, right? Re Either religion deals with faith, which we have no knowledge of, or religion deals with values, good and evil, whereas nature has no values, it's just facts, okay? Now, someone like the spiritual humanism says it's a fact that people have ideas of the good that drive them. That's just a fact. People don't blindly, you know, go around reacting to things. They actually formulate ideas and then they act on their ideas. Sometimes those ideas have nothing to do with the facts. It's pretty crazy. Um, so Aristotle would say, there's no such thing as human behavior. What we observe are decisions because what we observe are the union of ideas with the body. And we don't know what people are actually doing unless we know why they're doing it in their own mind. Um, now, in the modern world, that was all wiped out, okay? And the beginning point is that we're born a blank slate and everything is constructed. So, so even sexuality is constructed. Right. So um, femininity is constructed, masculinity is constructed. They aren't natural, right? They're social constructs. Um, and fear, all the fears that we have are socially constructed through the culture. So at that time, people believed that you could take science and study science in order to gain power over nature so that we could have all these beneficial technologies, we could have healthcare, we could have, um, everyone could be middle class, we could offer higher levels of education, we could get rid of disease, we could get rid of poverty, we could get rid of all these vices, all these horrible things are really socially constructed by people like the Catholic Church telling people they're sinners, that's all socially constructed. And incidentally, I have, you know, I have the solution, just pay the church and then you can go to heaven, right? Throw it out, it's all socially constructed. So greed, pride, lust, sloth, all those sins, they're all socially constructed because the society has the rich and the poor 
and this oppression is causing all of these vices, right? So if we use science and social science, in social science, we study behavior and we study, so we study behavior and then we make a hypothesis that says, look, if we, if we give people money to do this, right, a positive reinforcement, will they change their behavior? So you do all this research, what will change their behavior and then if it works, if your hypothesis uh, plays out, people did change, then you keep that and then you try something else. So it's all about behavior modification. Um, and so the belief was you could use science to get the middle class, you could use social science to get people to desire to be middle class, to get over all their vices, and you could create you could literally change the human playing field. You can change human history forever. You, you never have to have all that religious bigotry, all the stuff the Pope talks about, right? So that was the enlightenment. That was the belief. Um, and there are people today who think it was not wrong. It was just never tried and other people who think that was a faulty view of human nature in the first place, it was never gonna work. But you decide for yourself what you think. I'm not gonna do your thinking for you, but I am gonna describe it for you. And um, because I think it's fascinating actually. So here is um, utilitarianism we will do. Um, and we have an hour on this and you don't have to write anything on it, but if you want to, you can. Um, let me go back to how I described it in my post. So when you go to the post, this is what you'll find. We'll spend the first one and a half to two hours covering Aquinas, blah, blah, that's what we did. Then we'll begin utilitarianism. Be prepared to have three points related to either one, right? Um, I assume most of you will have more to say about Aquinas, the Pope, or King, because you've already heard one lecture, and now you have a second chance to read it and think about it. But some of you may want to discuss utilitarianism, which we'll do in the second half of the class. Please look over the material even if you're not ready to speak in class about it. I will begin, and then I told you the order that I would um, talk about it in. So you can, when you go over it, you can go over it in that order. So it, it could make sense, but I understand that I give you original documents and, um, and outlines. So I, I haven't used textbooks in my career and, and sometimes I think maybe I should have, but um, I just wanted people to get a chance at the original text. I wanted to treat students like they're capable of reading great books, right? And you can't know you're capable of it until you have to do it. Um, so I did give excerpts, just five page excerpts. They're not long. Um, but uh, let me start out with the history behind this position. Whoops, I'm sorry. Um, there's two out, uh, yeah, this is the outline I want. Okay. Okay, so here's the history, the historical context. And when I say this, I don't, my goal isn't for you to find out all about the West so you can just be chomping at the bit to be Western. Um, no, right? I think you need to know this background in order to know where we're at and what your country should buy into and what it should not buy into, right? Because you can't know if you're being brainwashed if you don't know 
you know, the source of the brainwashers and sort of the, the background of it. So some of the things that the West has to offer, I'm sure your country should adapt and, you know, would be better off. Other things that the West has to offer, you need to go, no thanks, right? Thanks, but no thanks. So I think you can do that best if you understand the history behind it. Um, so scientific revolution, there were these waves of reform, okay? So there was this belief that everybody's going to be middle class and temperate, it's going to be great. Well, it wasn't working. <laughs> so, okay, we got to try a little harder. So the um, utilitarians came up the second wave, okay? They weren't the original ones. The empiricism, their claim is that we are going to be absolutely faithful to scientific method and we are going to construct a whole society based on facts, right? Facts, facts, nothing but the facts. All right. Fact is human beings are blank slates. So they're the product of genetics and conditioning, but mostly conditioning. Their care, excuse me, their characters, their choices, all of that is a matter of conditioning. If they have red hair, okay, genetics. If they are more musical than most people, okay, genetics. But everything else is conditioning. Uh, people grow up in societies with inequality, and so they're conditioned to believe in this. But we're going to re-engineer social engineering. We're going to construct from birth. We're going to have all this social science to raise children equally with equal opportunities, right? And the key to this equality is education because kids have to get raised from the beginning. Um, if it's true that we are a blank slate, then children can be educated to become whatever the society wants them to become, but yeah, whatever fits and then everything will fit and everybody will be happy. Okay. So James Mill, John Stuart Mill's father was going to make his oldest son into the ultimate experiment, social experiment. So he took his son and he's going to use this enlightened social engineering and construct his son's character, okay? And um, so J Mill wrote a, an autobiography about his childhood because he realized when he got older that, oh, everybody's looking at me to see how the ex my dad's experiment worked out, right? I'm my dad's, I mean, I'm playing this role in the world that he did not, he was not aware of. Um, but when he was three years old, his dad was his teacher, right? When he was three years old, he started Latin. When he was eight years old, he started Greek. His dad, you know, studied every morning they study. They study together and he gets his homework assignment. Every afternoon he does all his homework. He's very isolated. Um, and then his dad sent him off to Oxford or Cambridge or something. And his, his dad said to him, uh, well, other people might not seem to be that smart, but just ignore them. You just keep doing your thing like we've been doing uh, because his father wanted to prove to the conservatives. The conservatives thought, well, look, you know, the coal mine workers, the factory workers, they're obviously by nature inferior because whenever we give them leisure time, all they do is go get drunk, right? So we obviously are by nature superior because we do all these cultivated things, right? And so we deserve to have our privilege. All right, and James Mill goes, nah. <laughs> no, you've constructed them not to have any hope, you know, to be desperate. Of course they're impulsive because that's all they have. 
they can't make plans. And of course, you're constructed to be this way to justify your privilege, right? So your parents very carefully get you exposed to the arts and music and all this hoity-toity stuff so that you can keep your privilege. And so James is saying, nope, all that's socially constructed. I'm going to prove it to you by having my son. Well, it turns out his son did score, have one of the highest IQ tests on record, <laughs> like 185 IQ or something. Uh, but he did have a nervous breakdown in his 20s. <laughs> and so he, yeah. He went through a few experiences in life. Let's just leave it at that. And it's, a, you know, I think it's a good story, but what it's about is how much difference does childhood habituation and construction, right? How powerful is the way you construct a child's psyche, right? And how much, to what extent are we a blank slate and we're totally socially engineered? And to what extent are there certain innate drives and innate ideas? So you should know by now, Aristotle thought there were these innate drives and then Augustine and Aquinas come up with these innate ideas, right? So that's the old view. Here's the new view. And you, in your lifetime, will meet people who have these different views. And they, I don't know if they ever talk to each other about it, but there are definitely people on the AUW campus who have each of the views I present. I'm sure there's somebody who embraces that view. You can also think about the way your classes are constructed and how the kind of reasoning that they ask you to do because then I give you the philosophy behind that kind of reasoning, right? Lots of times they don't explain to you, well, what's the worldview upon which this whole discipline is based or this whole class or whatever. So that's kind of my job. All right, so how are you gonna do this real science, right? Well, first of all, you're gonna study human actions, behaviors. You're not gonna study people's thoughts. You're going to study what they do, not what they say, okay? And you're going to judge those actions as right or wrong, right? Morals only in proportion as you can prove empirically that they promote human happiness. And they're wrong if they tend to prevent happiness or cause unhappiness. Happiness, you mean pleasure and the absence of pain, unhappiness, right? This is science because as a matter of fact, pleasure and pain and happiness are what drive human behavior. That's what human beings are. They are a kind of animal. They're, they're kind of herd animal. Same thing motivates them that motivates other animals. They're more sophisticated, they're more complex, but that's the same basic principle and they need to be conditioned. Um, people might say that it's their belief in God that motivates them, but you can't measure that. And so all that really counts is what they do and the consequences of what they do. And so they might say, what really motivates me is my love of God. The utilitarian will say, no, what really motivates you is the fear of hell after you die or the pleasure of heaven. It's pleasure and pain. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. Um, the religious doctrines appeal to pleasure and pain. They only get people motivated because of pleasure and pain. So let's go back to pleasure and pain. And then let's go back to which religious doctrines actually lead to greater happiness. And if a religious doctrine appealing to heaven and hell actually makes uh, leads to unhappiness in this world, it's a crappy doctrine and you gotta get it out of there, okay? Um, whatever we might believe, he says, 
We don't act on our beliefs unless we associate them with pleasure avoiding pain. Therefore, there's emotions. What really motivates us is not our reason. Our emotions are what motivate us. Um, there's no such thing as a conscience, a place where we have innate ideas, right? No such thing. The essence of our sense of good and evil is a feeling in the mind encrusted with associations, right? This blank slate of been having all these experiences, sympathy, love, fear, religious feelings, memories, recollections, all this stuff piled up. And that's what we, and you know, you crank all that stuff in and then people come out with something that they call right or wrong. Um, it's not based on character. Um, it's based, you have to base everything on actions. Now, how do you prove that that's the best foundation? Well, because as a matter of fact, it's the way people behave. Everyone seeks happiness. Okay, so what I'm going to ask you to do in your group's first thing, um, actually, I might make you break into groups for a few minutes. Um, yeah, I, I think that I'm going to ask you this just to break in for a minute. What do you think happiness is? Just off the top of your head, I assume most of you want to be happy, right? Is there anybody here who doesn't want to be happy? If not, if there is, I think you need a therapist and you're really psychologically unhealthy, right? So what so what do you think the word happiness means? What is happiness? And what do you, what is pleasure to you and what is pain to you? Okay? So I want you to break into groups. I'll just give you a few minutes because I want you to do this before we talk about what Mills says um, it is. So what is happiness? What is pleasure? What is pain? First reactions, and I'll put you in kind of small groups. Everybody should be able to say something, guys. <laughs> you don't have to say, I didn't read the assignment. It doesn't matter. Like, and if anybody says, I, it has never occurred to me to ask what makes me happy, then I think you're crazy. Okay. <laughs> okay, there you go. Okay, I'm all Marjana, Moshe, are you? Isabel, did you go somewhere? No, I didn't oh, think did, it. You haven't gotten a message about it? No. Okay, it says you've been, um, it says you assigned to room one, You so you don't have anything about that? Professor? Yeah. Oh gosh, I got disconnected because Chittagon is yeah. the weather is very bad. Yeah. <laughs> so can That's you put okay. me in the room again? Sure. Um, oops, Balak. Okay, I'm gonna sign you to room four. Yeah. 
was just have that moment where you stop and think about what is it, right? What do I really think happiness is? Um, so we- Professor, I think of a W D J party that we had. <laughs> <laughs> and now for one year we are missing that <laughs> i know i mean this whenever there was stuff up on the rooftop you know uh yeah exactly a dance contest and what new year chinese new year korean new year whatever it was fun i got, used to go to all that stuff a lot of fun professor yeah um but you could say why, right? Why does it make you happy? Because it's a bunch of women, you know, taking over, running their worlds, making their lives, whatever. But anyway, so um, what I want you to do is just compare with what Mill thought everybody could agree on. So he was raised, right, very carefully to seek these higher pleasures, right? The sole evidence to produce that anything is desirable is if people desire it. Well, people desire happiness. So that's, you know, that's it. We've got the only legitimate foundation. But what are real pleasures? Okay, the pleasures of the intellect, the feelings, the imagination. Um, so having empathy with other people, so John Stuart Mill was raised to have these pleasures, right? The question is, does he really understand people very well? Um, did I turn on the recording? No. Yeah, it's on. Yes, Professor. Yes, yes you, you, did. Okay. you did. All right. So, and how does he prove that the higher pleasures, that the pleasures of the intellect, empathy and the arts really are higher he says he does it like a science experiment everyone who's been exposed to both would always prefer the higher right it's an unquestionable fact that those who are equally acquainted with both give a most marked preference <laughs> a being of higher faculties requires more to make them happy okay now, is that true? So what I tell my students, that means every college educated person in the whole world prefers the pleasures of the intellect, empathy and imagination over those nasty, naughty pleasures of money, power, sex, <laughs> right? And physical pleasures. Is that true that every college student prefers the higher pleasures. <laughs> what I don't think so, Professor. Yeah, okay. Of course, nobody in this room, like my students definitely prefer higher pleasures, right? But what happened, right? How does Mill explain the fact that it sure doesn't seem that way to the rest of us? Well, he says, look, first of all, what is happiness? Uh, not a life of rapture, moments of such. Is this how you guys defined happiness? Would this be your definition? In an existence made up of few and transitory pains, many and various pleasures, with a, pre a predominance of the higher pleasures over the lower, having the foundation not to expect more from life than, than is capable of bestowing. Was that your first principle for happiness? Not to expect too much? <laughs> Is that what AUW students are supposed to think? Oh, they're supposed to go high, right? Aim high. Um, all right, if everybody had this opinion, you know, it wouldn't be that hard to, to you know, for everybody to be happy. <laughs> People don't have these views, okay? So his next position is the desire for the happiness of others is a powerful natural sentiment for us to have empathy with other human beings. And that's gonna be the foundation for utilitarianism. 
Do you think that's true? Is this feeling of, okay. Who is he um, arguing against? He's arguing against Augustine, the guy who believed that sin is, is natural, right? We want to do what's wrong because it's wrong. We're self-indulgent. We prefer the temporal and it's naughty. <laughs> he's, he's directly addressing that old point of view, right? And he's saying that actually, scientifically, we're a certain kind of animal. We have empathy for our own kind. And that's going to be the foundation. So this is, do you understand how different? You've just got to understand how different these two positions are. And today, right now, there are people who subscribe to both of those and lots of other things in between. But it's very hard to get people to agree on any kind of basic foundation. So then, of course, you can't build from your foundation if you can't even agree on the foundation, <laughs> what it is, right? So, you know, are people by nature after the fall of Adam, they want to do what's wrong because it's wrong? Or that's a stupid social construction. It's a way to manipulate people and get them to think they're sinners so the church can have power. Forget it. We're actually, empathy is natural, and that's where we're going to start and build a whole culture based on it. All right. Most of the actions we perform are just for the benefit of the people we know, but they don't conflict with our desire for empathy with others. Now, if I say, gee, you guys, you don't seem to prefer the higher pleasures, whose fault is that? Is that your fault or is that my fault? It's my fault, of course, because I didn't I wasn't good enough at conditioning people, right? So the capacity for nobler feelings is usually is oftentimes dies away. It's squelched because society forces people into these awful jobs and you know treats people so badly. So if people don't prefer the higher pleasures, it, it's not their fault, it's the fault of the the generation with power because they didn't construct the society well enough. What prevents people from being ha happy? A bad society, right? Bad laws or subjection to the will of others. They're denied liberty to use the sources of happiness within their reach. So that's the problem. Um, higher pleasures are in fact more pleasant they last longer, they are not dangerous, they bond you with other people better. Um, this feeling of unity with humankind should be taught as a religion. All the institutions, education should be directed toward this. So this is gonna replace religion. But he would say every major religion should actually accept the golden rule, you know, it shouldn't conflict, but we're, we don't want religion. We're going to have this secular basis. Who's going to run the new society? Well, it has to be people who have had the experience of the higher pleasures, just like me, John Stuart Mill, right? <laughs> I just happened to, like my father just happened to raise me, so I happen to know. And so people like me are the ones who need to be the social constructors, right? so that everybody can be happy. Um, all right, does everybody understand the basic idea here? Any questions about that? Let me just take questions for a minute. Or comments. All right, so ancients versus moderns, right? In, and then and then for you, you have to think in, in my country, does this play out in my country? Well, 
some people, like you said in your posts, some people in your country do think that you have to feel guilty, that you naturally desire irrational things. Um, but other people, NGOs, they, they tend to think, people running the NGOs, there's some kind of humanist. I think they would tend to think, no, that's all been socially constructed and we're trying to construct something different where people actually take pleasure in getting along with each other, right? And we're trying to cultivate these capabilities at a higher level. And when we do, people will realize that these are higher pleasures and they'll give up on all that other stuff and, every, and we can move forward, right? So that's... The basic principle, I think, behind most NGOs is at least some form of higher pleasures and the belief that if you reconstruct the society, people will respond and they will uh, start pursuing higher pleasures together. They'll cooperate with each other. Okay, so Mill really assumed higher pleasures. Now Bentham, who was a friend of Mill's father, and this is the reading, um, who they hung out, like Bentham used to hang out at their house. He, his view is that there are no higher and lower pleasures. He just says, he talks about, you could, you can, um, in your leisure time, whatever pleasures you want. So he says, push pin, or I suppose playing checkers or whatever you guys, whatever games you play is just as good as poetry, right? As long as you're not hurting anybody else. So Bentham says, let me have my own pleasures. Don't go telling me what should please me. I'm not hurting anybody. So, um, leave me alone, right? So he, he disagreed with his buddy's son. <laughs> okay, so he, he's, he's hardcore, right? Right and wrong is determined by pleasure and pain. Cause effect, this is real science, guys. All social institutions should be based on the study of pleasure and pain, okay? Um, everybody has to count, uh, everyone is equally counts as one. So when you're gonna calculate the pleasures, everybody's equal. The interest of an individual is the sum total of their pleasures. Um, okay, so this is similar. It's utilitarian when it promotes happiness. Um, let's see, an, an action a measure of government is good when it promotes utility. Um, an action that maximizes happiness is one that ought to be done. So you're getting your morals. This is where every any sense of right and wrong, justice and injustice should be based on maximizing pleasures. Um, let's see. Okay. So maybe people don't think that. Right, so he says, let's look at alternatives. Um, one possibility is, um, let's see, what would an alternative principle be? Well, whatever I approve of or disapprove of, but um, everybody would have a different opinion and that would be chaos, right? If, if he only wants his own opinion, He's a despot, he's a tyrant, and he's hostile to other people. If he wants everyone's own opinion to be the only principle, he's an anarchist. Like, we have to get together on this. Um, all right, so, oh yeah, this is the four sanctions are physical pain and pleasure, political pain and pleasure, moral and religious. Right? So one way of motivating behavior is physical punishment, right? Another way is the politics, the laws 
and the threat of being put into jail, right? Or fined. Um, and that's pleasure and pain, right? The moral sanction is people don't like you. They marginalize you. They make your life harder. So that's pleasure and pain, right? The reason why you want social approval is because it'll make your life easier. It'll make it more pleasant. And then the religious one is really based on pleasure and pain. The joys of heaven and the fears of hell and fire and brimstone. So he's saying, you know, it all comes back to pleasure and pain. Then he says, well, how do you calculate the pleasures and pains? And he's got this huge calculation, right? Every single pleasure and pain in relation to every individual, the intensity of the pleasure or pain, how long it lasts, whether it's very certain that will happen or not, and then if it comes immediately or, or long-term, and then um, the choice of being followed by more of those pleasures and pains, or not being followed by more. So, so it's a very complicated calculus, right? And people disagree on all this stuff. But he's saying he wrote a whole book on morals and legislation because he wants to get people thinking like that. First, you have to think that way. Then you start looking at the laws then you start thinking about how to maximize pleasure, okay? Minimize pain. So um, again, let me give you the example of abortion is a good example because on the one hand, you know, a religious person should say it's absolutely wrong and every state should make it illegal. But the reason why some politicians don't want it to be illegal is because it just causes more abortions. So they're looking at the consequences. So whether it should be legal or not is based on the consequences of, of being illegal or being legal, right? So that would be legislation based on consequences. And in general, the Democrats, whenever they, in, in my country, Whenever they are suggesting a law, like a gun law or abortion or gay, they will say, or racism, they will say, our country is losing X billion dollars because of racism. So we need to get over this. Or our country's uh, criminal justice system is costing way too much money and we just have repeat offenders. So they're always looking at the consequences. Whereas the other side, you break the law, you go to prison or you go to jail, that's it. Absolutely, you're totally morally responsible. I want to talk about it. The Democrats say, we have to have rehabilitation programs. <laughs> They're cheaper, people come out and they, have, they can get back on their feet again, right? So those are two very, very different ways of thinking about a good society and thinking about who is a good political leader, right? Are you looking for one who acts on principle, but the consequences are awful, it shrinks the middle class? Or are you looking at one that's maximizing the middle class, right? And then, of course, all of this comes back to psychology, right? What's a healthy psyche? So what sort of notion of happiness would a healthy psyche have? What sort of notion of pleasure? What sort of notion of pain? So that's the ultimate question uh, in this particular class. Um, all right, so utilitarianism focused on determinism, right? People are the result of their social conditioning. Now, Mill also wrote a book called On Liberty. I just have four pages and here's the outline. Okay, so he's, he, what he's, his view is, if you condition to, 
if you condition children to grow up loving the higher pleasures, then the adults will be mature and they will seek higher pleasures. Then all mature adults should have complete freedom to decide how they want to live. And toleration will promote the greatest happiness of the greatest number. So the object of this essay is one simple principle, the only goal for which people are warranted to interfere with other people's freedom is to prevent harm to others. That's it. You shouldn't ever intervene for their good. <laughs> I just happen to know better than you do what's good for you. No. Okay. Only to prevent harm to others. That's it. Otherwise, you should be free. It only applies to mature adults, right? Adults that seek the higher pleasures. Everybody should have freedom of conscience, freedom of thought, freedom of opinion, freedom to speak publicly, right? The liberty of expressing and publishing our opinions, the liberty of tastes and pursuits to plan our life, um, the freedom to gather together into groups that don't harm other people. Um, we should be able to pursue our own good in our own way as long as we don't deprive others of theirs, right? What's the benefit? Everybody's happier that way. The trouble is you got to make sure children are conditioned. And that, in order to condition them, you should forbid people to marry unless they can prove they can provide economic stability. Well, the assumption there is that people don't get pregnant unless they get married. <laughs> That's a big assumption in my country. Um, but John Stuart Mill would advocate the government coming in to a family and taking the kids out because the parents are not raising them to pursue the higher pleasures, right? Because you can't have a free and open society unless you have mature adults. So that wouldn't, in Mill's mind, there's no inconsistency between taking kids out of their homes and putting them into another home to get conditioned correctly and having a free and open society. In the mind of the average American, for example, <laughs> that would not be considered freedom, right? Keep the government out of my life. I can raise my kid however I want. People even, some people think in America, children have no rights. They're my property, right? They're mine. I own them. I take care of them. The government can't tell me what to do. There, there really are people in America, and I don't know again in your country, right? But for John Stuart Mill, that would be obvious to him that the state can do whatever it needs to do to make sure those kids get conditioned appropriately. But once you do that, um, you should be tolerant because of the harm of intolerance Everybody acts in what they believe to be true. Um, and these are some of his arguments. And you can, you can, you know, sift through them, think of what you think of these arguments. Um, the source of everything respectable is he is capable of correcting his mistakes by discussion and experience, okay? Not experience alone. So this constant examination and re-examination of your opinions, that's great. That's what, that's flourishing. That's what makes people happy. Um, but you have to make sure to have an enlightened view of freedom, <laughs> right? So what happens if uh, you happen to be a society that raises a bunch of immature adults? Right, what are you gonna do? Who gets to decide who's mature and who's immature? Oh boy. So what about this debate between Donald Trump and John Stuart Mill? 
Okay, what would Donald Trump think of John Stuart Mill's higher pleasures? And what would John Stuart Mill think of Donald Trump's greed, right? So they have a debate. They're both running for president. Who would you vote for in your country? What is happiness? Donald Trump, money and power. John Stuart Mill, intellect, empathy, and the arts. All right, what is pleasure? Money, power, and sex. What is pleasure? Intellect, empathy, and the arts. What is freedom? I can make as much money as I want, keep the government out of my life. I can do every, whatever I want. John Stuart Mill, freedom is the freedom to, to seek higher pleasures, to have these conversations with other mature human beings. Go ahead, Masoma. Uh, professor, I have a question. So Mill was talking about this higher pleasure and then uh, he was saying, okay, higher pleasure is always better than the lower pleasure. And then uh, we had the Augustine's view. He was also saying that uh, we have this internal world and uh, and then the temporal world, we should not choose temporal world. So this uh, lower pleasure according to Mel. So isn't then uh, they are similar in this kind of view, but their approach is different to the eternal or the higher pleasure, uh, but they are agree in this temporal and the lower pleasure. Right, what they disagree on is what we naturally desire. So that's a good question, right? So Mill says, we're a kind of animal and we naturally have empathy with members of our same species, right? Just like an animal, they don't kill members of their same species very often, right? And Augustine says, because of the fall of Adam, um, people, ever since the fall of Adam, people desire what's bad because it's bad. So it's natural for people to desire what's bad, the temporal. Whereas for Mill, what's natural for people is to desire these higher pleasures and to want this well-functioning society. And for Augustine, what's natural are lower pleasures. And so it's a matter of asking for the grace of God and focusing on eternal life after death. Does that make sense to you, Masoma? Uh, yes, yeah, Professor, it does make sense. But Professor, uh, I'm not sure if, if all the human beings, uh, you know, pursue higher pleasure. I don't know if <laughs> that is true. Right. Actually, you know, I want you to think about it and I want you next time in groups, you will talk about it. Right. But really, you should scroll through Mill's arguments. Right. And and, you know, I again, you should on your post tell me how much time you're spending on each one, because just reading those five pages, four pages. Right. Is you're trying to learn a, a line of reasoning, right? You understand this. And then what do I think of this, right? And the reason is because these are so radically different. Um, but when I taught this, I used to dress up like these people. And I was determined to convince the students that I was right, you know, because I do want you to understand that you, you can understand all these arguments and you can even, you know, you gotta figure out, well, where's the problem? Because they sure end up in a different place. So at what point do I really deviate from this, right? Where do I think they went wrong? Somebody went wrong somewhere. <laughs> Does that make sense, Masoma? Yes, Professor, thank you so much. It does make sense. And, it, and we have skin in the game, right? Our whole lives are based on our opinions of these things. So we can't exactly ignore it. Um, we have to, like, we can't decide not to decide, right? Especially when you come to AUW, right? If you never got outside of that little cocoon you were raised in, perhaps you never have to feel uncomfortable 
but oh boy, you decided to come to this college. Oh boy, people are going to make you have to question like Martin Luther King said, Socrates made people uncomfortable. <laughs> so AUW is really into making you uncomfortable. Um, but then that triggers your thinking. And the last day of class, the students are going to present to everyone their outlines for their papers. So it's exciting in the sense that I want everyone to come up with a different take on it. And then they then they have to defend it. You know, they know that I'm not going to get everyone. We don't all agree on this. Uh, but it is the foundation for how we want to live our lives. So we better pay some, you know, we better take it seriously. So that's that's what I want you to just get a sense of, you know, the stereotype about philosophy, well, it's just hot air, you know, people with nothing better to do sitting in their offices and smoking pipes and just talking, everybody else is trying to live, but that's not true, you know, everybody's out there living, but they're basing their life on some set of ideas, and those ideas are really different and they cause a lot of conflict. And so we really should sort through our ideas so that we can actually get along. So that's kind of my take on that. Um, who should rule? <laughs> what kind of a political leaders do you want? Um, so in my country, the Republicans call the Democrats social, right? They think the Democrats, the government's trying to control my life and they're, they're taking my money because they want money for public schools and public health and parks and um, they want gun control. And, you know, I don't, keep the government out of it. They want me to wear a mask. They, you know, it's uh, tyranny to make me wear a mask. Um, the, other, the other side is, if you want a democracy, everybody's got to care about public health, that everyone's educated, that everyone's healthy, that everyone has decent housing, that everyone, you know, is prevent, you know, avoiding getting COVID so that, you know, it's public health. So the Democrats care about the public and the higher pleasures, empathy with other people, the Republicans in my country care about the principles and, and they, they associate their party with religion. Um, so that's what you need to think about. Um, let's see, and then, um, so Trump would not agree with healthcare, childcare, or endowment for the arts, environmental law. Just leave me alone. Don't take my money. Um, let me make my own choices. Don't tell me about higher and lower pleasures. As long as I'm not hurting anybody else. Where the Democrats will say, well, you are hurting people because you're making it impossible for them to be educated or healthy or for their kids to be in a decent environment or exposed to the arts. So this is definitely the Democrats to have a national endowment for the arts is the idea that the arts are a higher pleasure and everyone should be exposed. So go ahead, Masoma. Oops. So Professor, I think uh, Mel was saying that law should be only practiced uh, uh, when some people is harming others. So otherwise they should be free. So I think the male should like, you know, leave Donald Trump uh, like that if, if unless he harms someone, isn't it? Well, it's just that um, nowadays, especially every time you use plastic, every time you have a higher carbon footprint, you're harming, right? You're harming other people and you're harming future people. Does that make sense? Yeah, Professor, if, if we justify that he does harm, then, then yeah, we should avoid. So it really, people really disagree on, first of all, they disagree on the principle. Mr. Trump will say, how do you know? Um, just let me make money however I want, leave me alone. 
I'm creating jobs. I'm making people happy, right? And giving people jobs. Um, I'm teaching my children how to be good business people. I'm a good dad, right? I made a lot of money. And John Stuart Mill is saying, no, everything we should worry about the public sphere and we need to tax the rich to pay for these programs so we can have a middle class. So does that, does that help? People really disagree and they really think differently. Uh, yes, yes, Professor. I just okay. want to know the mail's view. So it's not like I'm supporting Donald Trump. No, no, that's all, that's all right. Um, and then psychologically, which one's healthier, right? Which one um, do you think gives you a healthier psyche, enables you to live a flourishing life? Um, so I guess that's what I'm getting at. So we do, we just have five more minutes. Um, I will say that it occurred to me that while you're in breakout rooms, I actually have breaks. So I'm not, I don't have enough empathy with you when I don't give you, <laughs> I don't give you enough of a break. So I'll try to pay more attention to that because I, you know, I have a break and I don't give you a break. So um, any other questions though about this material? Because I will hold your feet to the fire in terms of when we start next time, I do want you to have thought about utilitarianism enough to be able to participate in breakout rooms, okay? And then I that's all we're gonna cover from Aquinas and Martin Luther King. So you're gonna have to do a post on it. And if, you know, we have a few more minutes for questions now, but again, I have office hours and I will stay after class for any other questions that you have. But um, anybody else have questions? Why doesn't everybody stay on and listen to other questions just for about two or three minutes? And then you can start leaving the class because the time will be up. Um, any other questions? Professor, I don't have a question, but I have a situation. On a Google uh, on a Google sheet, we can you can put the links of the recording, and then we can um, check the recordings from them rather than sending emails for every record of the classes. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. The thing is, I don't know how to do it. Uh, it's okay, Professor. I can make a Google sheet and put the links of the lectures that I have, and then I will share with you, and then you can use that sheet for the rest of the semester. Okay, thanks. Um, it's okay, Professor. I think, again, it's a matter of cultural conditioning. Uh, the way people learn this stuff, they probably forgot how they ever learned it, which is part of the culture. But for me, it wasn't, right? And I just sort of, how am I supposed to know that? Nobody told me any of this stuff, right? And some of it is I do forget, but some of it, I never learned it. And so, uh, it's okay, Professor. There are a lots of apps that is still, we don't know. Well, I honestly think um, that your generation in the developing countries can be a lot more savvy about technology because you know your future depends on it. Mm, yeah. Americans, Americans just, they're just typical empire in decline. They think, well, we're number one. And so we don't, you know, we're going to have the standard of living without, we don't have to do that, right? And yeah. so arrogant. It's, it's really crazy. So I don't know. <sighs> I don't mean to be arrogant. It's not like I wish, like I don't want to learn this stuff. It's just, and when I type in and try to ask my questions, like I'm just a dork. Like I can't, somehow I don't get the right words and the answers don't come up the way they should. <laughs> but anyway, you can help me out, Diana. You can sort of explain things to me. And, and um, Yeah, sure, Professor. I will do by today. Let's see. Anything else? 
All right, so I will stop the recording. Um, yeah. Yes, Professor. Um, 